How's everyone doing? We get, we get to warm the room up. That's great. Um, uh, my name is Kavel Khan. As, as Bonin uh, mentioned, uh, I am Chief Commerce Officer over uh, at Group Black and excited for the conversation today. Uh, with me on stage is Ben Dietz, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at Network, uh, and Vincent Yang, who's a founder uh, of Fireworks. So we're going to be talking about the future of retail. We're going to be talking about the future of commerce, uh, looking at new technologies. And the first thing you'll notice is if you put work in your name, uh, it's a signal to brands in here that it works and it's effective. So uh, I'll let both of my guests here uh, introduce themselves. So Ben, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about network and, and yourself and the work you're doing. Sure. So hi, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, maybe, and we're getting some feedback from the... the Interactive Jersey Mike games over there. Shout right. out Jersey Mike's. Uh, everybody get a sandwich later. So um, I'm Ben Dietz. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Network. We're a social commerce live sh uh, uh, live stream shopping platform um, based in LA. Started about four years ago uh, with the thesis that essentially um, the live streaming uh, and and um, digital commerce revolution that comes from China and has been proven over there as a you know hundreds of billions of dollars market. Uh, will eventually make uh, the travel west and, and become uh, adopted here. We see young consumers as being the forefront of that because they are they have grown up in a world where um, they get their cultural capital from uh, brands, media brands, influencers, and their peers in sort of equal measure. And so we felt like if we put uh, relatable figures on screen in live stream uh, uh, moments at where they are bringing products that are available exclusively to uh, the, the audience of those moments, um, we would have both a really interesting uh, place for to create heat and, uh, and desire, and then also we would be able to introduce an ecosystem where young consumers see people like them on screen, realize that they can make a jump to a position like the people on screen, and we start a flywheel that brings them higher and higher up into a ladder that eventually ends with um, you know, elite artists and, and, and creators like Takeshi Murakami, who we were closely with, Futura, Ben Baller, Sean Wotherspoon, and the like. Awesome. Uh, Vincent, want to tell us a, a bit more about Firework and sort of as a founder, what was the inception and the insight that led to you finding uh, or starting the company? Yeah, thanks, Kavo. So uh, actually a lot what you just talked about, the, the reason why, what Firework does is, uh, easy way to understand is the B2B enterprise version for TikTok, and very similar to what Ben talked about, the trend we've seen the same thing in Asia, where live commerce and short video shopping has been the key pillar for the growth for the retail sector over there. So what, when we saw that, we just said, hey, can we found a business in the US to do similar things? And then, um, but instead of doing things inside of a marketplace, as we have a lot of good play like the network doing that, we want to try another route, which is helping retailer to do short video live stream directly on their own website. So this is very unique. So for example, one example is uh, Gap. So if you can take a look, and uh, millions of consumers are going to Gap to shop. Well, so, to join us. Right. So what Gap has been doing is instead of I'm doing... I'm Selma Blair. Uh, and today I'm here see. with Eddie, is, showing is you some of my favorite Gap holiday picks to perfect any gifting situation. Is there a way to Let us know music? in the chat where everyone is viewing from. That's right. I'm Eddie, head of styling for the Gap. Right. So what you're seeing, and this is not on TikTok, this is not on Instagram, it's on Gap.com. So they're able to use our technology to do the entire live streams directly to their consumers on Gap.com. Right, inside of their apps. And uh, this is just some of the big exa examples that uh, you can quickly see. This is a um, similar example on Alberts and Safeways. So if today you open up the website, go to Safeway.com or open the Safeway app, you are seeing that now Safeway become the TikTok. They're using our tech to turn Safeway.com into a TikTok. All the content over there. Uh, yeah, these are just some of the examples. Um, this is Olaplex, how you're seeing how on their website, again, you can visit yourself, olaplex.com, $10 billion retailers, how they're doing live stream on their website. And then uh, this is Walmart, how Walmart is using Fireware to power the entire live shopping sections, right, on their website. So um, anyway, so this is some of the many examples uh, I can share. Not only they do it on a website, they can also broadcast to publishers. Right, this is the reason why we tie back to the media. So this is NBC News, right? Not only Walmart is doing this on a website, can also broadcast to NBC Universals. Um, they can go on to Vogue and others. So I'll stop here. The, the high level is many people think Fireware as 
the B2P version for TikTok. That's why for us, we raised about a quarter of a billion dollars funded by SoftBank, the largest shareholder for TikTok. For B2C, they also funded Firewall for B2B. So that's kind of the, the overall idea to help retailer, to also help publishers, to connect them together using our technology as short video live streams. Awesome. Uh, you know, we, we see the trend too at Group Black and specifically, you know, one of the things that we look at is that 85% of Gen Z, and specifically when you talk about diverse audiences, start their shopping experience with video and with interactive video. And so we know that we're going into th this year, CES is all a buzz about the coming recession. Brands know that this recession that's coming means that they have to prove the value of every dollar uh, that they're spending. So can you talk about the effectiveness that you're seeing and why the trends that you're talking about that led to the formation of both your companies, which is live shopping, interactive shopping, and video, uh, how that's outperforming sort of the way folks were, were um, shopping before and why brands should be leaning in now during the recession in, into this method? I think it's a good question and also Ben and I can offer two very different perspectives, right, from a marketplace model and also from a technology enabling model. At least what I'm seeing on brands, because we help brands to do it on their own website, by using the file of video commerce technology, because this is a new word we come called e-commerce, because before that everybody talked about e-commerce, now they're shifting to video commerce. Right? Video commerce is composed of short video commerce, live shopping, uh, live stream video commerce. Before Firework, average conversion rate on a website is about 1.8% conversion rate. After using video, they generally can double or triple that. This is actually very good in the recession times because all of the brands are focusing more about ROIs, the bottom funnel conversions. Right. You maintain the same advertising budget, even lower the advertising budget, but you can double the ROI using the video commerce. So this is something what we are seeing. Engagement time also increased a lot. In the past, people in general spent about 40 seconds to visit a website, like a Gap and Levi's, Alberts and Safe, et cetera. Now when you bring video directly to the website, they can generally triple the time they spend. When you do a live stream, for example, on Fresh Market, and people spend about 10 minutes on a website. Again, what is the last time you spent 10 minutes on a website? Never, right? Now you spend 10 minutes, you buy a tons of product using the format, which is already proven in Asia. So this is what we are seeing is about, this is actually much better recession proofs, right? We actually help to drive bottom, bottom funnel conversion and engagement for the brands. So I, it's important to note that one key number as it relates to my experience with network is that I'm at about day 60. Yeah. So I'm new to the company, and so for me to say I have a firm grasp on a lot of those conversion numbers would be uh, I, not accurate. But what I can tell you is that having worked in traditional media for many years, the, the, the challenge was always to prove how the top of the funnel awareness that we were creating for our brand partners with our audiences translated to bottom of the funnel conversion. Obviously, with live shopping, it, there's a really direct correlation, and you can show this is the dollars. These are the dollars you spent. These are the, this is the audience that you reached. This is the number of units that you sold. This is the price per unit, and um, and and create a, a direct ROI metric. So from a media perspective, that's new and that's really powerful. I think the the other thing you know based on on, on what Vince was saying that we're noticing also is that, and we tend to think of ourselves as social commerce rather than, than um, you know video commerce or, or or live commerce per se, because we believe that the interaction of the audience within those commercial moments is really important. And, uh, you know, as a, for instance, we just launched an auction function where now our, um, our you know, uh, partners can get on and can run auctions of their own. And what we're seeing is there's incredible conversations within the auctions themselves where consumers are trying to outbid themselves or outbid each other, outdo each other, become the sort of hero of that conversation. We dropped uh, a bunch of the Jordan lost and found. So this is Air Jordan ones that were just recently released and they were selling in the auction function for $200 over what they would go for at StockX or GOAT because the kids in the chat were going, I wanna be the winner of this thing. I wanna be the one that gets it. That on the one hand is a great commercial story to tell, but on the other hand, the person who wins that comes away with a story about how they won the cultural capital from that moment, and um, we think that's really valuable. It's going to return to, or it's going to uh, you know, create return behavior, and beyond that, just create a lot of value for our brand partners. Um, to, to build on that, Ben, can you, you know, network takes a very different strategy than others in, in, in the social commerce space. Most other players are, are sort of wide and, and they do a scale play. Network interestingly looked at culture and scarcity 
uh, as the value that it, that, it, that it drives. So, you know, even in lieu of the example you just gave, what can big brands learn from how network has been able to leverage this model to drive that deep, deep in, in, um, sort of consideration and value that you just talked about? How, how can that be replicated by brands? Well, I mean, I think, you know, one of the philosophies of my entire career has been if you grow the culture, you grow the market, right? And so tapping into that philosophy is really important. For us, what we try to say to, our, to, our, to, to brand partners who are taking – budgets that would otherwise be spent on advertising or on B2B marketing or, uh, you know, on performance is that if you come in and you create a project with us that, cr that uh, on the one hand creates a limited edition good that um, consumers take home and it becomes a, pr it takes pride of place in their homes, right? It becomes a long-term equity that attaches them to the brand and creates value and storytelling for them over the course of the, the time. Two, um, we have this object that uh, has continued value over the course of its life, meaning that it can go back into, let's call it a, a, a resale market, and it can create long-term um, value and impact for brands there. And then thirdly, that if you work with the best creators and the best and most um, relevant, uh, let's say, artists and audiences, it sends a signal about the value of your brand and um, you know your commitment to quality and to uh, delivering value to consumers, not to mention the fact that it also gives them an opportunity to um, get into conversations with partners that, you know, we're, we're, we work extensively with Takeshi Murakami, as I said earlier, like if, if brands call TMKK and say, we want to work with Murakami, Murakami doesn't call back. If brands say, network, we want to work with Murakami, we call Murakami, Murakami calls back and the conversation happens. So those are, I think, are the big ones. Amazing. Um, so switching gears a little bit, you know, at, at Group Black, again, you know, as, as Bonin mentioned, we are focused on sort of bringing equity into the industry. And, you know, let's looking at the audience piece, if you look at African-Americans, they represent about $1.4 trillion in the U.S. economy spending. A against all economies, that's actually the 15th largest economy in the world, bigger than Mexico. Uh, and so my question is, as you're working with brands uh, and as you're working with different partners, are you see, like what are you seeing uh, from them uh, as it relates to how they're trying to be more diverse in who they're going after and how they're leveraging the technology and the platform to do that? That's a good question. So, well, we have a technology which is what we call personalized videos. So, let's imagine today you go to Safeways, right? You can select who are the shopping assistant, what you want to interact with, what type of video you want to see, right? If you resonate a lot more to, you know. If on my side, I'm originally from Asia, right? If I resonate as a minority group from Asian, if, if you saw a video, it's more like a, from an Asian uh, creator talking to me, I feel much more resonating to the community. And same thing for African American, and same thing for other ethics groups, et cetera. So I think that's the one from an innovation perspective. We're developing a lot about personalized experience. We all think about shopping. Retail should be personal. It should not be once for all, right? It should respect all minority groups and communities, right? It should not be one community. It should be all type of community. So that's why internally we build a lot of machine learnings, personalization based on location for the community, based on the nationality of the communities, and also based on people's, you know, the uh, affordable income ratios for the community as well. So this is something what we're doing for them. And also we work with so many media groups and publishers, right? That's also, you know, certain publisher focus on a certain community. So we bring the brands to that community as well. So I think this is the, in these days, if you look at TikTok, one of the biggest things they talk about is algorithm. They want to make sure that a billion people are seeing a billion different feeds based on what they like, right? We capture the same thing. If I were focused on algorithms, it's the same thing. We want to make sure all brands can satisfy their different communities, right? using the new technology. But the core idea is use videos. It's the same thing with Ben and, and what we focus on, video. Video really can bring people closer. Our entire mission statement is empower brands to create a direct and meaningful connection to their audience. It's a direct and meaningful connection. Image cannot tell a connection. Text, there's no connection. Video tell the connection. That's why Gen Z really connect with that. Now when you add the community and personnel into that, they connect even more. So I think that's kind of what we can help in, in a different way. Awesome. I would say this. I think, you know, for us, we don't have to make an argument about the value of the audience because the composition of our audience makes the argument for how salient 
creators of color are, audiences of color are, and um, generally speaking, that uh, the kind of, of cultural overlap between all kinds of demographics is 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 coming together. Um, we're 65 percent. Uh, 65 percent of our audience identifies as non-white. Uh, 85 percent of them uh, identify as as being between 18 and 34. So I think you you really see that. Um, going forward, these index audiences are multicultural and uh, come from diverse backgrounds. What we want to do basically is say to them, um, we are interested in putting the most relevant and interesting creators in front of you. Those are naturally a lot of African American, naturally a lot of um, you know, Hispanic, Asian, uh, and, and you know people from across the spectrum. So I, I don't know. It's like for us, it, it doesn't need to be a part of our practice because it's a part of the underlying thesis. and Therefore, it's going to be something that is present in everything we do. Right. And, and that's a big part of you know, the partnerships that Group Black is doing with both Firework uh, and with Network is saying, hey, we have a connection to that audience uh, through the collective that we have that reaches that audience. And how do we partner to ensure that uh, the, the technology is being leveraged as, as part of that? Which gets me to the other side of the coin. You know, we're, we're not just focused on audience. We're also focused on you know, the disruption we want in this space is focused on black-owned media companies, black-owned brands. And specifically, we work with a lot of black-owned uh, B2C brands, a lot of them retail brands. In every sort of change uh, and technology change, and, and fundamentally, I think we all here on stage believe that, you know, the change that's coming with live shopping, video shopping, social commerce is going to massively disrupt how people shop. There's always a group that gets left behind. Uh, and so... What are your thoughts on how black-owned brands, especially B2C brands, need to uh, sort of adapt to the change? And also, are there things uh, that you all are doing to ensure that as you're building this technology on the bleeding edge, that you're making sure that you're bringing in a diverse group and it's not just the Fortune 100 companies that get access, but there's a, a more even distribution? Yeah, so if you look at Firework, we, we serve over thousands of brands right now. So I would say maybe a dozen of Fortune 500. The majority are actually the mid-sized and emerging brands, right? Some owned by Black, some owned by Asian, et cetera. So this is what we focus a lot. But essentially what I think is all founder, like I'm a founder too, I'm a friend of minority groups, is um, we all have story to tell, right? The key thing for us is how do we use technology to empower brands to tell their unique stories? Every single business you have story to tell. But can we tell a story by writing five paragraphs on the text, on, on, the, on the article? No, nobody's going to read that, in particular Gen Zs. Video is a much better storytelling. So that's why, to us, our fundamental philosophy is empower brands to tell a better story, empower brands to do much better connections through the video technologies. Right? We are building a lot of features to empower one-to-many live streams, empower people to do asynchronous short video chat. We are launching one-to-one -one chat. Right, we're launching dynamic video, very similar to Netflix. They have the interactive videos. We're launching the Firewall interactive video to give to all retailer, right? So that all of the audiences, consumer, can select their own journeys, right? So this is all what we're doing to help those minority group founders to tell their stories. And and I think from our standpoint, the 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 philosophy basically is that if we make the technology available to people, we make the marketplace culturally salient and relevant, and we make um, we send signals that this is a place where they belong and where they will succeed. Um, then you know th those 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 uh, small businesses and and um, those typically and traditionally underrepresented people will show up on the platform. So what we're doing is a couple of fold, right? On the one hand, we are working very closely with retailers from across the ownership spectrum to make sure they're represented on the platform, that they have a strong voice, that they're elevated in our content mix, you know, through our algorithms, that sort of thing. On the other hand, we're about to um, go to market with a, a much more uh, let's call it publicly available version of the platform where other people will be able to access the technology and go live from their own, um, uh, you know, bedrooms or uh, studios or whatever the case may be. And of course, that will give everyone a chance to, to use it. And, and so it's a matter for us then of just publicizing the fact that this is available so that African American communities and, and everybody else gets on and goes, Yes, this is this is the place for us. You forgot to mention your partnership with us at Group Black and how we're helping. Well, you so I want to talk about that too because I think you know, the, like the other thing that's really important about our partnership with Group Black is that it it, it is not just about um, enabling, empowering, and and celebrating um, 
you know, communities of color, but it's also like looking into the places that are most relevant on the cultural calendar and creating moments that brand communities can rally around, audience communities can rally around. So Hip Hop 50, for instance, like 2023, 50th anniversary of hip hop being created in the Bronx, like there is going to be a year long partnership that we work on with you guys that, that um, will celebrate all of those artists, all of those art forms and all of those communities. And that's really exciting because it's, that's a, a new thing to market, but it's also like so culturally obvious. I mean, hip hop, the, the, the greatest American art form of the second half of the 20th century, like, yeah, of course we're going to, of course we're going to do it. Um, so you, you all, again, you're on the bleeding edge of technology here. And, you know, as you're talking to brands, I imagine as always, there's some hesitancy, right? Brands, brands, I love my brands, but you know, they want proven, but never been done before at the same time. <laughs> and so how are you educating brands on the value and all the insights and data that you see that should signal to them, you need to start making the investment now in, the, in this technology. How are you helping brands to sort of cross that gap uh, that f to lean in more into social commerce, interactive shopping, live shopping, et cetera? I think we solve this by two folds as how we run company. Uh, there's a book called Crossing a Chasm. There's always the early adopter who want to try everything. There's always the, you know, the mainstream and the late adopter who don't want to try everything, right? So for us, at least we have about 400 people. So the way I talk to all of our team is try to identify the early adopters, right? The late adopter will come to you to say, who else has been doing that? But the early adopter, they ask the same questions, right? But if the answer is no, they love it. They want to be the first one. So if you look at all the brands, even some of the big brands, you might be surprised like Gap, they want to be the first one to do that in their sector. Fresh Market is the first one in the grocer sector. Albertson is the first one in the much bigger sectors. So there's always those early adopters, at least from a, a founder perspective. Our goal is to find them. So there are, I think, 10% of early adopters. They want to try everything. So I think those are the best of the best customers for us. But then for the, for the bigger ones, right, and like Walmart part of the world, so what we work with them is more starting with pilots, right? Starting with pilots, a few gradually, gradually penetrate. So this is what we are doing. Yeah, and I think for us it's, it's, it's not only, um, you know, talking about that, you know, connection between the top of the funnel awareness and bottom of the funnel conversion that I talked about earlier. But it's also, you know, coming to them with proof points and saying, for instance, just before the holidays, we did a partnership with the McAllen, um, where Ruigi Villasenor, who's the de designer of Rude, a pretty prominent streetwear brand, as well as the creative director at Bally, the Swiss luxury brand, um, designed a, a, a custom package for the McAllen that was available in, a, in a, a limited edition, went live on network, sold through in minutes, and then because of the way that US alcohol uh, uh, rules work, it has to be fulfilled through Drizzly. What happens then is the McCallum saw a six figure lift in additional sales beyond just the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of sales that we did on the, on the front end for the package um, because they saw consumers who were just like, I didn't get the thing that I wanted, but I still want to be a part of this lifestyle or actually I'm a McCallum consumer generally and this is another opportunity to get in. So we tell them stories like that and start to say, here's how you're offsetting your marketing spend in a, with a real demonstrable ROI, as well as you've driven a cultural moment, as well as you've worked with a guy who is, you know, if not the next Virgil Abloh, then somebody who's certainly in that sphere. That turns heads and they start to go, oh right, this makes sense. Awesome, yeah, that makes sense. I think you're absolutely right about that early adopters being sort of who needs to lean in and, and usually get the advantage and can scale faster as a result of that. Um, I'm watching the time here and I do want to end on time so we stay on track, but one to open it up to see if there are any questions uh, in the audience, otherwise we can close out. We are very friendly. So I feel like I, I'll talk in two fronts. Number one is the macro social commerce. In China, for example, the social slash live commerce accounts for about 40% of the total e-commerce market right now. China's e-commerce is about a few trillion, similar to the US side. Social commerce and live commerce is half of that now, right now. US right now was what, sub 10%, sub yeah. 2%? Notably sub 10%, so right. the upside is gigantic. So from a macroeconomic perspective, that US is much smaller, just the beginning. So then when we talk about 
the customer perspective, from the Alberts and Safeway uh, perspective, we start with on a few pages for a few banners. Now to be every single banners on every single pages, if you say, what is the file market share is about doing social live commerce? Well, I would say 100%. So we actually deliver every single revenue driven by short video live commerce, right? Is doing that, similar to Gap and all the others. But again, those are the early adopters. Early adopters that re they really want to see their e-commerce part of the business. I would say maybe in the US in two to three years, 20% of the e-commerce will be more done by social commerce or live commerce, 20%. But you know, to get to China's level, Right. In China, for example, last year, just for live stream commerce, they did about 450 billion GMV. Just live stream shopping, which is actually bigger than the entire Amazon. Just on live stream shopping, right? So anyway, that gives the scale, and that gives the potential of growth in the US retailers. That, that's a very good question. So we look at the creations, we help on three ways. So number one is uh, we actually have a creation studios. We have over hundreds to thousands of certified live stream creators that we can actually help the brands to do that. Pretty much all the brands, we help them to do the creators. That's number one. The second, we also has a panel of consumers because Gen Z, they don't like those stage video, it's too fake. They want the user generated video. They want authentic ones. We also build up a panel of consumers, which can help to create video reviews, et cetera, so put it on a website. And the third is those super big brands like Walmart, they normally have their own creator resources, so they do it themselves. So basically we can help all threes and we can do the whole thing one stops, fully managed services, the way how we do with Levi's and Gap, we do the whole thing for them. The tech, the creator, even traffic, because we can also help them to broadcast to media like Group Black if they say, I'm not satisfied just doing it on my website, I also want to target certain audiences, right? We also help them to put it there, whether it's on Vogue, Condé's, on a group black. So these are the way how we can help on content. Great, just a follow-up question, Sam. How do the creators get paid? So creators get paid, they have three tiers, right? The super big celebrities that get paid by per live streams or number of videos. And then we have the medium to nano creators. One thing what I find personally very interesting is we also have a big business in Japan and Asia because we all know Asia is leading the way for that. Like for example, Muji. Muji is a very big top, top retailer. They are our one of our best customers. So what Muji has been doing is very interesting. They actually use their store manager and store associate to do content, which is way more authentic. The conversion rate we're seeing is about 40% conversion rate. Again, average e-commerce conversion is 1.5%. They're seeing 40%. Content creation causes zero. It's all their staff member, right? Because who are actually your best, if you're a retailer, right? Who are actually your best content creator? I would say it's the thousands of store associates and the store staff members. Why don't we turn them into, they're the one that can showcase a makeup much better than anyone else and much more authentic. It's not fake, it's not pay to play, right? So that's why gradually we fire are actually evangelizing and building products to help the brands to leverage their own store associate to create. Then the content creation cost is zero for them. So I think that it actually underscores a really important point about just the authenticity of the content. And I think one of the things that brands often ask us to do is help them understand how to take this, the collaborations that we make with them or, and just generally live shopping moments in, in general to audiences in a way that doesn't feel forced, doesn't feel over manicured, doesn't feel, you know, cringe to, to use uh, my, my daughter's term. Um, and, and so that's another place that I think we can really add a lot of value to the, to the conversations and in fact, uh, you know, is, is a service that we're looking at developing as well. Other questions? I have a microphone now for anybody. I, I have, oh, yep, yeah, okay. No, no, no. Oh, I, got I got up to get the microphone. You're going to use the microphone, damn it, okay? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, I, would, I would ask, especially from the, from the fire, side like what what are you seeing as the he hesitancy I mean I, I work in network with Ben as well so I, I know I'm hearing what it is as far as like the culture side of things and stepping into new fronts but what are you hearing right now as far as hesitancy for people getting into it especially with all the data and and research that has come out of it and the positive results that have come I would say the hesitancy is very similar to what you asked is the content so every brands are busy so in particular what I call the late adopters they some people see a reason why not to do it, and some people see a reason why to do it. 
So the hesitancy is more for the, for, the, for the former. They always say, I don't have resources, I don't know how to do content, I don't have any creators. And again, they, they hold the view that content creation is very expensive. Whereas for the early adopter, where in Asia, content creation is zero. Content creation is a daily habit. So I think for all the other early stage sector like your business and our business, there's always an education time. I think that time may be a few years where we, and together, we're telling the brands, look, content creation doesn't need to do what the old TV was, hire a celebrity, pay a ridiculous amount of money. It actually doesn't need to be this way. So it will take some time, but well, we, we already see thousands of brands who are our customer already doing that. So, you know, it's interesting because I was in China right kind of as the, the wave was beginning. And of course, it was like, okay, I see it over there. It's definitely coming here. But it's been, I don't know, five, seven kind of years, uh, you know, maybe five. And it hasn't really, no, I think one thing, so I've worked with a lot of clients on it and they do the same thing. You're like, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create 70 shows a week. They're like, what? No, we're going to get one big celebrity. And, then, and you're like, it's going to fall on its face, but you do it because that's what they want to pay for and it falls on its face. But I guess my, my and I clearly we believe in it. Um, but my one question is, is we, we compare it always to, to China, but the consumer behavior there, and I guess my question is, is will the consumer behavior here ever get to the same? I don't think so. So right. that's a very good question. I right. talk to CMO all the time because right. I'm coming from right. China and right. live in the U.S. for the second half of my career. No, in the right. U.S., in China, they leapfrog the website days. People don't purchase on website. And also, the brand loyalty is not very strong. That's why in China, 3F dominates everything, right? The WeChat, the uh, Alibaba, now the TikTok version in China, etc. People got entertained there. People shop there. People do online dating there. Do you, technically do everything in three mega apps. Whereas the US is very different, right? When we want to buy a jeans, where do you go? Do you go to Instagram.com and search for jeans? No, you go to Levi's.com, isn't it? Right? When you want to buy some food for tonight, where do you go? Instagram? No, you go to Safeway. So in the US perspective, consumer has a much stronger brand loyalty. That's why Shopify is very big in the US. There's no Shopify copycat in China at all, right? So because of that difference, what, what I find is the US brands, the live stream and video is irreversible trends, but people are doing it in the wrong place. The right place, at least from our perspective, is on your brand's website because consumer already coming. It's very difficult to change the consumer behavior. Millions of people already come to your website. If you're a rough Lauren, 20 million people come to your website every single month to figure things out. They're already coming. You don't need to guide them to somewhere else. You just need to bring the stuff that already work to your website, to your apps. That's our thesis, right? So anyway, it's just the consumer behavior is very different. Let's not change it. Let, let's bring that works to something that US consumers are already shopping at. Yeah, I think we differ on that a little bit in that what we believe is that rather than consumers wanting to go to a, a series of um, you know, wide ranging and widely scattered places that where you can bring a curated point of view and where you can bring uh, a tightly edited group of the most relevant products, they will tune into that and they will stay there and that's where we create brand loyalty. So I think we, I, we agree that, that US consumers are, are more brand loyal. We believe that we can build a brand loyalty around network and we can have them come to our marketplace, curate the right marketplace sellers and the right creators there and that's where they will do all of their buying because it, curate, it's, it matches their lifestyle, not just matches uh, everything that's available in the market. See, Cavell, that's panel tension. That's how you do it. No, but I do have one, 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 one. It's interesting that you brought that up because through pandemic, you know, I would get phone calls from retailers. They're like, oh my God, are, are we ever going to need stores again? Or what are we going to do? And my whole thing was, hey, dude, turn all your associates into, I mean, put them on Zoom, put them, you know, like, but they couldn't wrap their head around that. And specifically one of the big cosmetics brands who already have people fighting for, you know, or they already have artists that are, you know, big on Instagram, you know, uh, and yet they couldn't make that pivot to see that they could actually be the, the front end salespeople in that digital channel, which they could touch more people. But I guess my, my question around that is, so you said part of it is adopter, late adopter, but are there are there enough brands out there talking about the successes? So like I don't really see 
uh, you know, we see the networks of the world, but I don't really see a lot of the brands touting that they've already begun to have success there. And I, I guess my question is, is why? Uh, and then the last piece is, yes, a lot of consumers go to Levi's, but don't more consumers look at Levi's on other places? So I guess, how do you rationalize that? I think it could be. So that's why the we always have the two sides, right? One is the social media part of it. It's the same thing, the battle between Shopify and Amazon, right? There are 450 billion transact, uh, a GMV happen on Amazon. There are also about 400 billion transactions happen on other websites powered by Shopify. You have both. Consumer can go to designated places or a consumer can shop on other websites. So, but if you search around, I think Fiverr right now are one of the few that push for the other rounds, which is brand doing this on their own website. Right. We're the biggest one, we're close to a billion dollars, and then uh, we got raised ridiculous amount of monies, right? And a huge army out there. You're seeing a lot more brands doing that, right? Last year we grew almost from 50 brands to a thousands of brands in a year. And it would grow from zero Fortune 500 company to pretty much 10 to 20 Fortune 500 company adopting this. I would see the voice gonna be stronger. But again, naturally people gonna be more noticing the B2C players, right? Like the network, which is very good jobs on branding, like the whatnot, et cetera. People are not gonna noticing the B2B infrastructure play. Because when you go to Safeway, there's no firewall, it's Safeway. Right? We're just saying enable it. It's the same thing. Shopify didn't get noticed until people realized the market cap for Shopify is $50 billion. Then people are like, wait, what just happens? Why suddenly the company was becoming $50 billion? Why I've never heard, if you ask the street, who heard about Shopify? Not too much. Who heard about Amazon? Everyone. But if you ask the Wall Street, right, which is a much better business, you will see as an infrastructure player, right, it's a little bit more solid. So that, that, that's why less people hear about the B2B infrastructure play, more people hear about B2C. I think both will exist. There's not too, too much competitor perspective. Same thing, Shopify and Amazon, both will exist for different purposes. People wanna have their own website, build their own branding, Shopify. People wanted to create a store very easily on the marketplace, Amazon. It's the same thing between you know, how well we are doing business. I, I wanna just add something, a, a, a different vector to that, which is also that I think in, in, in our experience, the dollars that have come from the brand community to activate through social commerce have largely come from, let's call it media innovation buckets or R&D buckets, right? Those tend to be smaller than what they're spending uh, on their larger above the line campaigns. And I think what, as we prove results, more dollars siphon over from the above the line those, the preponderance of those spends gets larger. They become talking points at a uh, organizational level and at a global level. And the other thing that is important here too is that a lot of our spend is driven by younger members of staff, people who are seeing themselves in the consumer behavior and seeing their friends in the consumer behavior and saying, lobbying their bosses to, to, to spend in this way. As they rise in the ranks of, of these organizations, they will begin to determine more where the money gets spent and we believe the, the momentum will follow them much in the same way that uh, dollars in social followed the rise of the millennial generation as, as decision makers and so on and so forth. It's like when Bonin had black hair and he was advocating for digital and no one listened to him and then when he got some power, all of a sudden digital spend went up. That's his way of saying a great hair. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a huge round of applause. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you, you guys very much. I don't know what the time, are we, is there a 10 minute break? Okay. <laughs>